Hello, Ray Lee with Speedboat Magazine here with another episode of the Boats and Bros podcast with my bro, Myrick Coyle. And we have none other than the world famous Steve Curtis offshore racing champion. How are you, Steve? Yeah, really good. Thanks. Good to see you guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Steve, so I remember racing like I was... Yeah, it felt like being young. And I remember going in a race against you and I asked Johnny Tomlinson, I said, who's so in your opinion, who's the best throttle man in the world? And he goes, that guy right over there, Steve Curtis. And uh, <laughs> I was like, oh, man. And you pulled away from us and it was St. Clair, Michigan. But then you dumped it. <laughs> <laughs> that's me <laughs> win or swim <laughs> yeah win or swim we got it out of here right off the bat i was i was gonna say uh i think we we're all everybody was all right thank goodness uh we're standing in the street at uh in st Clair, michigan and we we're having some beers afterwards and talking about the event and and steve comes up and signs my shirt and it says win or swim steve curtis <laughs> i was like this is the coolest shirt ever <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. It was a yeah. We got this brand new MTI, and they'd work. Gary Stray worked night and day rigging it and putting it together, and we had no idea. It, but it was fast, you know. It went up, you know. St Clair was flat calm. We went up there, <laughs> and a boat went over on that corner. Yeah, and I just backed it down, and we turned. We can't have been going any faster than forty five miles an hour, and it yeah. went over like a canoe. I mean, it just yeah. kind of flopped. I mean, yeah, it didn't do any damage at all to the boat. It just flopped over. And I came back and I said, Randy, what? It just flopped over. I said, I, you know, I, it just went over. Oh, yeah, where were you trimmed? I said, oh, I freaking know. I mean, it just, you know, it <laughs> yeah. felt all right when I backed down. <laughs> I wasn't really looking at the trim. Didn't even know we had trim indicators. And, yeah. it, and it, it, it was weird. And we, we went back after that race. And that was the first time we ran the back. We did some testing. And we, we ended up having a lot of success with that boat. It yeah. really was. It was a good boat. Uh, I raced with Tom Abrams for, I don't know, three or four years. We won a bunch of championships and stuff, but it was a, it was a fast boat, very twitchy. Yeah. I remember you plopping one over as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Just, yeah. Just a couple of races <laughs> after that. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and them, the narrow sponsons, uh, hey man, they, it's, it's, uh, it's it's crazy how it doesn't give you much uh, input. It so you go into the turn and you're like, man, it feels pretty good, and all of a sudden, whoop, you're done. I mean, it's just that quick. So <laughs> you'd have no but, warning. And yeah, they, afterwards, they, you'd never know why you'd say was you know I was trimmed the same as I was last time. It felt good, and it would just yeah. it was so fast when it happened. It didn't give you any any warning. It didn't feel like it was sliding. It just went <sighs> plop. Yep. So yep. um, exactly. Yeah. But, uh, we've always joked, uh, you know, especially when we're at the bar or whatever, after the race and, you know, Steve's motto is winter swim and, and, uh, <laughs> but you've been doing it for a long time. I mean, when was your, when was your official first race and what kind of boat was it in? My first class one race. So big boat. Well, I raced since 82 and that was in a, a little, uh, Cougar, which was my boat with twin outboards, very much like the, there were 2.4s back then, uh, very much like the sort mm -hmm. of super stock boats today. And I, and I raced that. My dad, you know, I was very fortunate because I grew up with my dad building boats and stuff, Cougar power boats, which were, you know, the boat to have at the time. Um, and, and my dad had just started a, a boat yard on 188th Street. We were bought the old Donzi boat yard <coughs> and we were opposite Apache, um, just down the road from Don Arano. And my dad used to race with Don Arano when he came to Europe in the cigarette. So we knew Don real good. In fact, I stayed with him a couple of days at the house and stuff. And um, so we were all into it. And we've just come out with this 27-foot outboard boat, which they ran a lot of in Europe. Um, we built a lot of wooden boats over there. So they used to call it Class 3D over there and Class 3E. So we built a fiberglass version. Um, and I started racing that in the 80s. And, you know, we were running. The thing would run about mid eighties, but it was, you know, a lot of fun, you know, no canopies, no nothing, just, yeah. you know, and I think my first race was in Fort Myers. I think it was an 82 and I can, it was really rough and we completely smashed the boat to bits, <laughs> broke all the stringers out of it. You know, the honeycomb bulkheads and 
but we came i think we came second anyway we, we were pretty good we were pretty happy with it we didn't even have yeah, seats yeah. in it i put it together we had no budget you know we went there you know just about afford the fuel you know homemade trailer it was you know really budget racing but you know yeah. just so much fun and i got into it and then i got a bunch of different rides with you know, V-bottoms. I raced with a guy called Nicky Kutra on a boat called Boardwalks and V-bottoms, a Seahawk V-bottom. Um, but, you know, just hitching rides here and race, race with Danny Weinstein as a navigator and power play. Um, sort of really just doing my apprenticeship. And then in 85, yeah. I hooked up with a guy called Tony Roberts in a a big, in a, what was it? It was a, uh, uh, what's it, cat? It was a Cougar cat design, but a fiberglass build up in, Michigan way. Um, what do they call them? Not active cats. Maybe it was an active cat. Um, anyway, we I went out there. First race was in New Orleans, which was a blast. I mean, I love New Orleans anyway. Al Copeland's put on these fantastic parties and yeah, stuff like yeah. that. <laughs> and um, I think due to attrition, it was flat calm. Um, we didn't get a really good start, but there were a bunch of Seahawk boats broke, and uh, I think Bobby Kaiser had a problem. We ended up winning the race. So it was on my 21st birthday. In class one, I thought, oh, this is brilliant, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I've, this is a piece of cake, this class one <laughs> racing. <laughs> and then the next race was Sarasota, and it was really rough in Sarasota again. And we'd just taken the lead. We had, like, half a lap to go, and I blew a drive. But I was missing the throttles so badly. I didn't have any weight in the front of the boat. It was all set up really badly. But we had a big following sea leg coming back, because that those days you'd race way up north. Yeah. I mean yeah. almost up to clear water. And on the leg back, I mean I was, because I didn't have any weight in the front, the boat ran pretty good. So I'd just taken the lead, overtaken I think it was Willie in his in the big thirty eight foot cougar that he had, aluminium cougar at the time. And just as we we're just about to come into the thing and do the finish, we broke a drive and that was us done. So Damn. we thought, Damn. well this is all well that's a shame. You know, we were beat up and Tony Roberts was beat up. Pete Carrington was navigating for me. He was beat up. They all had to go and see chiropractors and <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> I was pretty beat up as well. And we went up to, we had a race in, I think it was Northport, Michigan. And another really, really rough race. And we set out there and um, the boat completely delaminated. We hit about three waves and tore the whole side out of the boat, put it up Gee. on the beach and left it there overnight. <laughs> Came down the next day and had to crane it off the beach. But it was, it was finished. Yeah. So that year we, we, um, we managed to rent a boat off of a guy called George Cabrera. And it was the old Michelob light boat that Joel Halpin passed away in. Um, another V bottom. In fact, Popeye's in yeah. the milling area hit it and, and Joel Halpin died. Jack Sudeville was soldering it. So we, uh, George Cabrera, uh, built it, um, bought it, um, raced it once. Um, and then, rented it to us to race in Key West. And that was 1985. And back then, there was one race in America one year and another, you know, for the World Class 1 World Championships and another race outside America the following year. So it would go alternate yeah. years to America, back to Europe. So I think in that race, I think there must have been 25 Class 1 boats on the start line. Holy and, crap. Um, and no one even knew us. And we ended up winning it. You know, Ben Kramer was running Apache at that point um, and running hard. And Delavali was there. I think Delavali came second. No, I think Ben came second overall. We won it. Um, we got two seconds and a win. But um, it was that was really I, the start of my race. I'd have probably been scared. I'd have been scared to beat Ben Kramer. <laughs> you never know. You know, like, <laughs> oh, man. You know? Well, Benny was, yeah. I mean, Benny. If you were like, you know, with all those guys, you know, there was a, you know, there was that period when there was all those smugglers and stuff, but, you know, they were nice guys. If, you know, when you met them socially at the bars and all that yeah. sort of thing, you wouldn't have known, you wouldn't have had a clue. I mean, my yeah. mom used to come to the races and she'd be sat alone and you'd have Willie Falcon say, oh, come over and have breakfast with us. She's sat on her own and stuff like that, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, and, and now know, they're like, uh, now their yeah. show's called Cocaine Cowboys. Cowboys and things. And, <laughs> but, you know, that, that was how it was. But there was a lot of guys 
you know, I think they dramatize it on TV. You think it's worse than it was. I think it was like a business to a lot of those guys back there. I think Ben was probably pretty badass. You know, he was, you know, what, what is he? Meyer Lansky's nephew or something. Yeah. Um, but oh, not wow. many people know he, that. He was willing but, to take a risk. Yeah. He, and, you know, he put a lot into it. You know, he loved boat racing. Um, but, you know, how he got to go boat racing probably wasn't the, the easiest yeah. thing. You know, that was a pretty hard job in itself. But he, he ran hard. He, you know, those guys, he was, you know, absolutely fearless in a boat. Absolutely. You know, Bobby Sassenti was unbelievable. And then Bobby had the big accident, the way he stuffed the cat, you know, and that, then he got with different throttle men and stuff. And I ran with Ben a couple of times, tried out with him. Um, but, you know, I went back to Europe when that was all going on, which was probably the smartest thing I ever did. Because, <laughs> yeah. uh, you'd, have probably, in, you'd have probably uh, been a business partner or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, at that point, I went back to Europe in 86. Um, and, yeah, it was, you know, I came back over again in 87 and did some more running and won the Worlds again with the Seahawk guys, funnily enough. They were, you know, oh, great cool. and I still know a bunch of them now, you know, and they're great guys. They've done their debt to society and stuff like that. And they're yeah. super nice. They're family dudes. They're, um, but when, you know, I talk to them about it and stuff and say, well, you know, what was it like? You know, he said, you know, it's just like running a business. He said, all right, you know, we, we, you know, it, you know, they were, they were basically blue chip companies, the amount of money they were. So, yeah, you know, I never condone it. It's not my position to condone it or to do whatever, but, those guys had a, you know, that's how they made their money at the time. You know, they were young, they were wild. And it was in all sorts of motorsports. You know, NASCAR started with, you know, the bootleggers. You know, we were all yeah. about that. And, you know, in Europe, the car racing was all about double invoicing and this and that. You know, it was a motorsport has always been a very much a cash sport or cash sport led business. You know, to, to spend the sort of money you need to to be competitive in motorsports without direct sponsors is difficult. So it's, yeah. you know, and um, so you, you, it tends to, you know, attract people with big adrenaline rushes, you know, people who are wild and crazy and who are willing to take big risks because you are risking everything when you go out there. Yeah. And, um, it, you know, those, and those people tend to be a lot of fun to hang around as well. You know, so <laughs> yeah. back then there was, you know, great parties you know, and stuff like that. And it was a great scene back then, but they, they seem to whittle away pretty fast. Yeah. That's cool. I, I really, I never realized that you started your racing career in the United States, you know, and being 188th street, I always thought it was overseas and then you came over here. So that's wild. I didn't know that. No, no. I started it in the States when my dad opened the yard, I came over and we'd opened Dad had opened a boat yard in the Philippines. He had, you know, we had two boat yards in 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 the UK, um, and we had, you know, the one eighty eighth Street. And because we were selling quite a few boats over there, you know, Popeyes, you know, all the boats, all these the new, you know, super boats were they were all Cougars, you know, Gentry, yeah. Copeland, yeah. Morales, all these guys were running around in al aluminium Cougars or aluminium Cougars, as you say. Um, yeah, <laughs> and they they needed a place to serve. Al them, really. al aluminium sounds yeah. way cooler. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because you you don't read it how it's spelled, though. But it's, yeah, it's the oh, I, 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 I say it in the shop. I say it in the shop a lot, just from being around you and and the the way it's it's written and, and it's funny the the way that it comes out. They're like, what? And they're like, aluminium. <laughs> so yeah, so they really built it to to um. You know, and obviously I'd gone to a lot of races in Europe with Dad. I'd been a mechanic for uh, Ted Tolman. Well, I say a mechanic, more of a boat washer, to be honest. Um, at my school holidays on my 16th birth, you know, over the, when I was 16 years old, that holiday then. And, um, you know, and I loved it. I thought, this is cool. You know, I went from racing motorcycles, um, 125s and stuff like that, and just didn't think there was any way I could get into racing offshore. It just seemed, you know, mind-boggling that I didn't, mm -hmm. you know, I get to yeah. it. But obviously I got a good start with my dad and the fact that I was around these boats from such a young age, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, you learn a, a lot. Yeah. 
Gave me a leap frog into it. A lot of people have asked me, like, you know, through the years, how'd you do it? And I was like, well, it's basically starting at the bottom of the team and then sticking around long enough and just retaining a little bit that everybody's taught you. Because let's say I've learned something from Steve. I've learned something from Gary. I've learned something from Johnny. I, you know, it's everybody that you meet, you learn a little bit and then you got to just hold, retain all that information and use it when it, you know, comes into play. Yeah, very much so. You know, and I was fortunate. I worked with a guy called Smitty, Weird Howard Smith, they called him. And he throttled for Ted Tolman. He throttled for Benny Hanna. He was in the era of um, El Lanier and Bob Idoni and those guys. And um, so, and he taught me a lot. You know, he was very methodical on how to prep the boat. We had these big, long checklists for everything. And, you know, he was yep. a grumpy old fuck, to be honest. Excuse my friend. Yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. but he was a good dude. You know, he was, yeah. you know, and he taught me quite a lot, you know, compared to, you know, and everything was immaculate with him, you know, it was, everything had to be immaculate, which is, you know, a lot of the boats that those in those days over here was rigged by Bob and Jack's rigging, you know, and they were pieces of art, you know, beautiful mm-hmm. anodized this, and, you know, they were gorgeous, you know, and, um, you know, in Europe, it wasn't much like that. They were a bit more... um I guess you could practical, let's say, you know, the brackets were, you know, they weren't all anodized and polished stainless screws here and there. And when I came to America, you had the big, you know, all these amazing trucks and, you know, trailers and, you know, they were as nice as the boats. Well, in Europe, it, you know, it was all about the boat, you know, how you got it there didn't matter as long as it got there, how the, what the trailer looked like, it didn't matter. And that slowly filtered over to Europe, you know, so they got to that. Okay, how do I do that? Uh, <laughs> yeah, no. Mom's out of town. Ta- Mom's out of town. I'm in charge of all the rugrats, and I can hear just guns and video games happening in the background. Myrick's Mr. Mom this weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, so I, I, you know, I learned a lot from that, and it was fantastic. You know, I gotta say that period of my life where you don't have much responsibility, all you got to do is, you know work on the boat yeah you, know, you got to party at all the races no yeah. one's saying why aren't we going fast enough and you know is it going to be rough tomorrow you just do what you're told and for, yeah. well, you know i was like Steve, 18 you had mentioned, years old so you had mentioned few of the other guys were were fearless how would you rate your your own fear level or fearless level when you're racing in those days oh i was a little crazy i guess um <laughs> when i was younger i didn't have you, a lot you of have fear. you have to be you have to be <laughs> Yeah, or you're yeah, going to be in the back. <laughs> yeah, and I think with the cats as well, it was a bit of an unknown. We all knew, you know, it was always, hey, if you want to go good in the rough, you got to have a monohull. And dad was a, you know, dad obviously was very knowledgeable on cats. You know, he designed them and built them and stuff like that. And he'd be like, oh, put some weight up the front, put more, you know, and I'd come along with, you know, 10 pounds. And more. No, 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 you need more. So, and we really especially with the alley boats. The wooden boats were just smashed to pieces, unfortunately. You know, they got to, they were fine for a bit, but, you know, they'd, they'd get brittle and work and work, and then boom, they'd fall apart. The alley boats were tough. They'd just bend. So you'd come back from a race, and you'd be getting jacks out and jacking the bottom back down, uh, and cutting really? panels out, whirling them back <laughs> in. Um, but, you know, and then we certainly learned that, you know, you could put weight forward, you know, and that would settle the boats down, and, you, you know, you wouldn't, you know, you, you wouldn't go crazy fast in the flat, but in the rough, you could just get into it. So, and that was a, that was in the uh, late, very late eighties that we suddenly the cats almost in the rough were as fast. And now, I mean, if you went back then and said, you know, the boats were, I guess, running 105 miles an hour when they were the open cockpits, 110 maybe. Now, if you can, we can run 110 in six foot seas. You know, we run <laughs> 110 flat out thinking we would just, taking the world on and now mm-hmm. you run that in four or five foot seas i mean it, you wouldn't even thought it but you know <clears throat> the hulls are improved the balance is improved everybody's learned how to do that you know when i went back to europe um in 87 88 no 89 yeah 88 89 i raced a little one of the old seahawk boats a little 36 foot cougar and with twin lamborghinis had a lot of power there for the size of the boat the boat was reasonably light 
and we would just kill everybody in the rough. There was us and Bootsy in that big four engine boat. And yeah. he would just take off if it was really rough. <clears throat> but we'd be second in this little 36 foot cougar. And everyone's, how are you doing it? How are you doing it? And it was just that we ran a lot of weight up the front. We ran our CAG further forward. And it took years for them to work out what we'd done. I mean, literally years. You know, we'd have tune taps like everybody else, but it was all about this weight, you know, and we'd do it at night so no one would see us doing it and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and <laughs> instead of nowadays, you see them carrying it over to the boat just because everybody knows, like, how much are they putting in there? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, the sport's changed, you know. It had little modifications, little modifications, but the speeds that you can run in, you know, I don't think the speed in the flat is overly impressive, you know, but the speed in the rough is where, it, for me, the sport's got it, you know, and, and cornering speeds improved quite yeah. a bit. So, Steve, uh, speak to that, the pe people that don't know about how you guys used to do it back in the day. You'd go miles and miles and miles offshore and completely go out of sight as opposed to today's offshore racing. Talk well, about yeah, the differences. If, if you look at Key West, compare Key West from 85, you had two, I think, 100-mile races and one 160-mile race on the Sunday. And the last race was three laps. So, you know, they were... You'd go out, <laughs> yeah. head down to Miami, turn around, come back a little bit. You know, they were big laps, you know, and it was, you know, you had to navigate. There was no GPS. You know, always, you know, mainly took a navigator with you, not all the time. Um, but, you know, you, uh, we did back then. We had a, you know, a navigator. We had a compass and a stopwatch and would draw out the course. All the laps were different. For me, I enjoyed it more. You know, it was cool, you know, to have a navigator and, and if you messed up, you had more time to catch up. Yeah. It was, you know, sometimes, you know, you'd break something, fix it, and get going again and still do yeah. it. I've, I've, heard the sto I've heard the stories of the navigators, usually a good mechanic, because that way he can grab his tool bag and hop back there and start working on it. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> While you're still you know, racing, yeah. yeah. And most of the throttle men back then were mechanics. You know, I, when I worked for Tony Roberts, I was a mechanic. You know, I prepared the boat drove the truck to the races, you know, and, you know, there was two two mechanics. And then, you know, Tony Roberts would come in. Pete Carrington was navigating. He did come in because he had another job. And um, that was just how it was. So when you broke down, like you said, you'd jump in the back, fix it, change. We carried spare propellers. We carried a toolbox, had fittings <laughs> in it and stuff like that. You <laughs> had a life raft. I mean, you, you know, when we used to do the, you know, the Miami Bimini race and stuff, there was a boat guys that sunk the boat and they were stuck in a life raft for like four hours before they found them <laughs> bobbing up and down. You know, it was, yeah. you know, it was a different sport back then. You know, what we do now is obviously a lot faster, you know, at the speeds we go, they can't get the safety out there, but I've got to say it's enjoyable. And, you know, like the cow's tour key, which is probably the oldest running yeah. power boat race has been going for over 60 years. Well, about 60 years. I think, yeah, just over 60 and, years. And you've done that one still recently, haven't you? Yeah, I did it. You know, and we did it in, you know, it was unbelievably rough. I mean, I was in a 46-foot aluminum Cougar. We almost were coming off plane going around Portland Bill. And it's <laughs> basically 100 miles in one direction. You turn around and 100 miles back. Um, and some years they stop in Torquay and some years they don't. But it, it's a fantastic race. And it's not, you know, now you've gone off the line, you just hold it flat out for the entire race and the entire race is like 45 minutes that race you take off and you're like well who's going to break out do we hang with them oh this yeah. leg's going to be really rough so we'll back off and wait till then and it can take four or five hours you know of running that's i cool. mean when we did it i did it with um richard carr and um paul um and paul paul sinclair has always wanted to win it you know he's raced boats forever bought cougars and stuff. I mean, and he, he, he was so emotional about it. He was crying when he got back. In fact, yeah. he's had a tattoo put on his arm <laughs> of winning the race. That's, that's awesome. It's a, it's a really big thing. Yeah. And um, I think that everyone who races offshore should have the opportunity to do that sort of race, to know what it was like. Because it's not about speed. It's not about, it's about 
navigation, you get lost. You can get lost for a long time because you don't. Yeah. You're, you're away from land. You don't see any land. Yeah. Now, modern day GPS is it's easy to to see, but you know I, I've run it with just a compass, and all you see is water around you, and you're looking at your compass, thinking, "Well, I'm going. To, I'm going the right way. I'm sure I'm meant to be over there. I can't possibly. <laughs> Aren't we going left? You know, and you look at it and go, "No, no, no." I mean, yeah. you've got to believe in it, and then boom, you come in and yeah. you, you know. Got your stop talk you about, say? Yeah. Talk about mind games with yourself. You're sitting there, man, I hope I didn't screw up. And you know, and then <laughs> and then you're like, I'm in the lead and you know, that's that's awesome. Well, you don't know if you're in the lead. Because the problem is you're coming around, you know, if it's really rough, you can go inland to try and get flat water. Mm-hmm. So and back then you weren't allowed to have radio communication. Oh really? With the shore. So you come back from the race and say, "Oh, how'd I get on?" <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. you know, there's been quite a few surprises like that. You know, obviously, if it's a flattish day and you can get out there and run up front, you know, and you're on course, no one's going to sneak around you. But yeah. a lot of the rough races, you'll you'll they'll go off the start and then you'll come to like a headland, and some boats will go inside if the wind's off the shore, try and get flatter yeah. water. Some boats, you know, and that's where really a, a navigator comes in. Yeah, but yeah. It's cool. he can be... Everybody should have to do it. I think. <laughs> yeah, I always think that that Bimini run would be fun. That sounds like a neat deal. From yeah, where where, where did they run that one from Miami to Bimini or Fort Lauderdale to Bimini? Yeah, we used to the Picardy Cup used to run out of um, the main inlet there, where all the shipping boats are. What yeah, are they government's uh, cut. Go, yeah, government cut, and you used to run out there, turn left, run up the um, coast a little bit up to just south of Lauderdale probably about Hollywood or something, and then just turn straight across to Bimini. And it's it's not that far on a flat day. I mean, it's yeah, fun, it's a long way, but, you know, and then you turn around and come back. Yeah, that's cool. That's a cool race. But, you know, it's easy. It's, that one's pretty easy to find. You're not short on land for long. You know, yeah. if you're running reasonably quick, and the couple of times I've done it, we've, you know, within, you know, you're only out of sight of land for like 10 minutes. Yeah. You know, and then you've got the island in front of you. You've got to find a boy there and then, boom, turn around and come back. Yeah, so uh, what's the fa- your favorite event that you've ever that you've ever done? I think, you know, <laughs> you know, some of the great, you know, Cows Torquay is great because it's very nostalgic. Yeah. Norway, when I was racing for Spirit of Norway, was fantastic because it was like you're, I mean, almost you're like a celebrity there. Everyone knew who we yeah. were. Uh, and it was a massive sport there at the time. Um, so that was a brilliant mm-hmm. event. Um, you know, Key West is always fun um, mm-hmm. as, as, a, as a week-long event. I think it was more fun yeah. back in the 80s and 90s when it was, you know, every, you'd, you'd, you'd leave your boats in overnight. So the night before the event, the boats, all the boats would be in the water at the marina, in that galleon marina, as they called it back then. Yeah, And the atmosphere then was just brilliant i mean it was just brilliant the races were brilliant and you had so many competitors from all around the world coming there it just made yeah. that it was a brilliant event um you know and i realize there's a lot of restrictions nowadays it's not as easy as it has been to run these races you know it's tough on the promoters there's so much red tape etc um yeah but yeah i think you know in the early days key west, come to key west you got to rush monaco was a fantastic event um you know, so there's been, you know, Arundel was a fantastic place, particularly being with the Norwegian team was a, a, yeah, a terrific event. I bet. I think that's that's what Johnny said. He, I think he raced over there. I think that was one of his yeah. favorite races he ever ever did. Yeah, I mean, Steve, you've yeah. you've become like the uh, elder statesman. Did you think that you'd be racing uh, this far into the career? God no. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, I, I always thought that I'd probably get into something else. I, you know, at one stage, I was going, oh, I'll go back to racing motorcycles. You know, I love motorcycles, still do. Um, but you know, do you, do you have a motorcycle? Oh yeah, I got lots of motorcycles, oh, yeah. bikes and road bikes, and yeah, huh. I love. You bikes. won some championships in motocross, right? Yeah, I was one twenty-five European champion and stuff like that. That's awesome. So yeah, I like bikes, but I got beat up like everybody else. Broke some, broke my hands and stuff, and. I was out for a while, and then that was it, really. And, you know, I also realized, you know, I had some friends who were just 
naturally better than me. I mean, I'd, you know, ride my heart out. You know, I got a good friend, Graham Noyce, who was 500cc world champion. I mean, what that guy could, I mean, he just, you could buy, go by me with the back wheel waving at me, you know, and I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, I'm strung out thinking, what, you know, what's going on here? So I, I didn't have that natural ability that, um, that I think you need to be, you know, one of the, you know, the, the real good ones. Um, I think when I got my championship, I was pretty lucky because it was muddy. It was a three, it was a, you know, like a three day event type of thing. Um, and it was a real muddy event and I was pretty good in the mud. Um, and I, I guess I just got lucky <laughs> really. Um, but, um, you know, I probably sometimes, didn't sometimes luck comes into it. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, and I got into boats and at one stage I was thinking, oh, I'm going to get out of this. But if people were still, you know, willing to pay me to do something I loved and it wasn't like a job for me, you know, obviously it's different to be in a car race or something like that where, you, you know, you still got to work on the boats. You've still got to do the, the hours and all that sort of stuff. But I loved it, you know, and we went through that terrific period in the early 2000s when there was lots of sponsors, you know, we had Spirit of Norway, then I had the Qatar team and stuff like that. And, it, you know, it was really, really, really terrific. You know, it was a bunch of great people, you know, the, you'd go all around the world and it was a big deal. I mean, it really was. People would recognize you walking down the street. And I thought, well, you know, what's the point in stopping? And then I came over here with the Qatar team and they pulled out because of the World Cup and, you know, they wanted to concentrate on that, which we understood. You know, and then I got hooked up with, you know, Gary again, who's, you know, I've known since we were kids. In fact, we worked together with Reporter, which was one of my boats in the 80s. You know, I've known Gary forever from the same town, Gary Stray. So we we're really, really good mates. Um, so, you know, they bought the 96 after the, the turbine boat caught fire. They bought the 96 Qatar boat and asked me if I'd run it. And I said, yeah, sure. So I got got that together and then we got the Husky deal. So. Really, it's been, you know, the last, oh God, almost 10 years, eight years, yeah. you know, I've been with them and that's been a lot of fun too because I've known Gary and we're good mates and stuff like that. And, yeah. you know, so, and it, time flies, you know, it seems like yesterday I was the youngest guy in the pits and everyone's going, yeah. God, he, what's he doing getting in a boat? He's too young. <laughs> and now I'm like <laughs> one of the oldest. <laughs> yeah. But I've had yeah. a great run of it. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. Um, you know, I've, it's been a you know, it's been brilliant. That's cool. That is cool. Uh, yeah. Gary Gary told me a story one time about it was. I don't know whether he was on the crew and you were throughout. It was. I think it was overseas and something about him riding with you and you were really hot dogging it over to like an award ceremony or something. Oh, yeah. and, and he said, all he could think about with the whole time is how his mom's going to kill you because you <laughs> killed him is what he said. He was saying, he goes, my mom's yeah, we going to kill him. Back in those days, it, that was a cow's talkie actually. And we turned yeah. up there and um, we had a boat yard. Cows is on the Isle of Wight and it's literally, it look, it's bottom of England. It looks like, They've cut off a sort of V and moved a, this bit of land out. And it's, it's an island. That's exactly what happened. And you've got the Southampton water, which is where the, you know, the Titanic left from and stuff like that. Very famous port. So my father had a, a marina on the mainland. We had the boat. Gary was part of the team. So I said to all the guys, we had to take the boat over for scrutineering on Friday morning. So I said to all the guys, right, we've got to be there. I was crew chief and stuff. And so I said, right, we've got to be here at, you know, six o'clock in the morning, boat was in the water, ready to go over. So I'm stood there, you know, we get there and the only guy who shows up on time is Gary. And it's like eight o'clock. Some of the guys, you know, obviously said, you know, screw Steve, we're going to stay in there next round. Oh, they're going to have a few yeah, beers yeah. or whatever. You know, what have we got to get over there so early for? So I said, come on, Gary, we're getting in the boat. And Gary was, I guess, about 16 at the time. I think and, that's what he did. And he wasn't very big. And he'd never driven a boat before, you know, hadn't driven a car, you know, because you've got to be 17 and hadn't driven anything. So I said, come on, jump in. So he was like, what, where? I said, you know, get in there, you can drive. And he said, I I've never driven before. Explain <laughs> explain what the cockpit layout was. <laughs> Weren't you in like separate, separate canopies, like across the boat from each other? 
Yeah, it was two. It was an aluminium uh, boat again, thirty-six foot, the old Seahawk boat, and with two cockpits. And you're like ten foot away from each other, so in, <laughs> in the sponsors, and you've got these canopies, these Hawk canopies. So I mean, Gary is tiny, um, and so I gave him a life jacket to put on and a crash helmet. But you could have spun the crash helmet around his head. <laughs> So I don't think we I don't think we actually put them on. So we're going across and it's a really busy bit of water. And I said, I'll tell you where to go, you know, point your directions, you go and it'll be fine. And he said, Well oh. I said, I don't I won't go that quick. So we get up on plane and we're going across to Southampton water and there's boats everywhere. I mean it's one of the busiest bits of water in the world. So I'm pointing them in the direction. We're running along and I thought, well I'll give it a little zap, you know, just to make sure the RPMs come up and the basics. <laughs> So I'm doing that. As we're going along, um, we go off the, the back end of this sailboat, you know, so I'm going over there and he's looking at me and his eyes are like huge. <laughs> and he's giving it all of this. Like, and we hit this, we go across the wake of this big sailboat and this sailboat's all at an angle, you know, because it's quite windy and it's big mast up there. And we jump up and it sort of comes up on its side like this. And I'm sort of looking at him, giving him the thumbs up and all that. <laughs> <laughs> and anyway, we land and go on into the port. And he, he got up on the deck, you know, as we come into the, you know, the dock thing. And you can see he's like, his adrenaline pump is shaking and stuff as he came in. And he said to me afterwards, he said, my mum's going to kill you when she finds out you made me die. <laughs> his mum knew my mum and dad and stuff. And um, so, but yeah, that was his induction. Probably into driving powerboats as well. Yeah, Good old Gary. That's right. Yeah, we, it's we it's, it's probably one of the reasons he likes working on them more than driving them. <laughs> Put him right on. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, Steve, that's, you had mentioned that's a great yeah. story. You imagine being ten foot away from somebody your first time, and you hit this giant <laughs> wave, and he's over here giving you one of these, and you're thinking, "Oh my god." <laughs> I'm gonna that die. The greatest, the that's the greatest was, he story. He was so small, he couldn't sit on the seat and see over the wheel. So he had to stand on the seat and crouch down. <laughs> and I didn't really realize that. You know, I thought he'd sit on something, but you know, he's sort of <laughs> there, you know, he's just hanging on. That's the best story ever. <laughs> that's so funny. Uh, so, Steve, you had mentioned the uh, the 96 Spirit of Qatar boat, um, which seems like it's going to be the fastest boat ever to run the uh, Lake of the Ozark shootout because it ran, what, 244 miles an hour over a mile, which yeah. they've since shortened it. So it doesn't seem like there's any boat that out there, technically, they could beat it. I think it would be tough on a three-quarter of a mile. I think you could beat it now on a on a mile. I think we could have gone faster that day. I mean, unfortunately, that was the day when Mike had his crash. Um, but you know, Mike didn't pass away until almost two or three days later. Mike Fury of Outer Limits. Yeah. Yeah. Mike from Outer Limits. And it was because of a a blood clot. It was nothing to do with his injuries. It was a blood clot that went up into his heart. So, um, but at that point we'd run 244 and it was, I got to say, it was pretty exciting. I mean, because the acceleration was pretty massive. Um, and because, you know, we'd found out that Mike was okay, and then we decided to do our run. The first one we did, we had a, the parachutes came out in the boat, so we didn't have those. Um, Most epic picture of all time. <laughs> yeah. Going down, going down dragging. the lake, dragging these big pieces of canvas behind them. <laughs> I'm going, this thing's not handling very well. It's all awesome. <laughs> <laughs> they like, broke off, sort of laid down a bit after that. But, yeah, we... Um, <laughs> <laughs> once they burned off but we didn't have any spare power <laughs> shoot so and it did make a big difference if if you'd have dropped if it started to flip you hit those power shoots it stopped you from flipping it it brought the nose down and we we'd done a, quite a lot of aerodynamics on the boat to stop it from flipping um so the target was 250 miles an hour um and i probably need i had a different set of propellers that would have made it accelerate a little harder and probably would have laid it down a bit quicker um, because the problem is with those turbines until they actually get spooled up they yeah. don't accelerate real quick and you can only start it at 40 miles an hour if we could have gone in even at 50 miles an hour we'd have come out so much faster but that's the same for everybody 
So yeah. we we were going to head for two fifty, um, and I think with everything that went on, we didn't. So I think in the mile it would be easily breakable. I say easily breakable; it's still bloody fast, but it, it, yeah. it you know that's quite you know that's breakable. I think three quarters of a mile because of that first. I don't know what it is, 100 yards or so, where you're trying to wind everything up with a boat. You're trying to get it out of the water. Yeah. That's what makes it awkward. So it's not yeah. like you really have a, a, you know, three quarters of a mile. You've really only got half a yeah. mile because the first quarter it, of a mile, you're, you feel like you're not getting out yeah, your it's, own way. It's, it's the hard parts, the 40 to 100. Once you yeah. get it to 100, let's go, you know. But until you get it to 100, it's that's the hard part. And by shortening it, what they should do is, they should shorten it, but let you go faster into it. Or something, yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's just, you know, but that, I mean, they look, the faster you go, the more accidents you're going to have. But I would rather do, I mean, the same week um, or the same weekend we did it, Johnny was parked next to us and he went like 100, maybe 200 miles an hour in like a 38 foot skater, no canopy. Yeah. He had yeah. an open top helmet, a pair of shorts, and a t shirt. <laughs> and I'm going, and Johnny was like, oh, so I said, look, I would much rather be in a full canopy boat with parachutes and, <laughs> you know, yeah. trimmable wings that I can balance the boat out with and that than I would in a 38-foot skater with two bombs in the back that you're just <laughs> freaking pulling the pins and saying, okay, here we go. Uh, you know, yeah. I think we were infinitely safer than Johnny T in that boat. You know, so, um, yeah, it was – you know, obviously it was impressive. It's something I'm very proud of. You know, I did a lot of design, you know, on how the drive system all worked and stuff like that. Engineering wise, I was pretty chuffed with it all. Um, but, you know, I, I think even when people are going out there, they're almost achieving more, you know, not going so fast in three quarters of a mile. And I certainly think, you know, there's a, you know, I wouldn't want to go in a lot of those boats at the speeds they're going because if they do have an accident, there's, yeah. yeah, they're going to be in trouble. Some of those V bottoms running. Oh, you that know. factory, that factory billet boat, hundred and eighty yeah. something in three quarters of a mile. Gee. Yeah, I mean that's rolling in a V bottom. Yeah. I mean it's going to take nothing to, you know, to, that thing to kick off sideways. Get it in, get into a chine walk that you can't yeah. get it out of, basically. This podcast is powered by Speedboat Magazine. Subscribe now at speedboat.com for nine power-packed current issues a year direct to your mailbox.